Uh, I think we're live. So uh, welcome everybody who, uh, who has joined. Uh, as you can see, we have a new setup and we have uh, Carl here as well today. Nice, uh, nice that you can join us, Carl. Thanks for having me, Jane. And I, I think I'm excited because, well, I am excited. There's no doubt about that. But I think I'm the first live human that you've had on the stream. Yes, like a, besides myself. Then. So thank you for opening it up. I'm really excited to get to just chat today while other people watch. Yes, yes, exciting. Um, so uh, for those who are new, uh, welcome. Uh, my name is Jane, and I am the uh, uh, engineering manager at the DevRel team uh, for daily. Uh, maybe you want to introduce yourself, Carl? Sure. I'm Carl. I'm pretty new to daily. I started back in mid-August. I'm um, a senior engineer, uh, also with the DevRel team, but having a good time sort of like jumping across the com company and learning different things as I go. Perfect. Well, I'm glad that you uh, you could join us. Uh, it's uh, certainly something different than I've done before, and uh, I look forward to doing this more often. Right. Um, so, yeah, today I oh my the stream stream info is uh, still saying something wrong. So it's saying that we're showcasing daily pre-built features, which we are not doing. Oh, we, okay. The, <laughs> the thing that we are doing is uh, chatting about. Uh, um, development tools and processes. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to quickly change it. Sure. So how have your first few uh, weeks or months been at Daily so far? They've been, you know, really intense. It's been about a lot of learning and, you know, getting used to functioning completely in a remote um Setting has been fun and it's been a good challenge and it and it kind of suits me. So, um, yeah, it's it's my brain is very busy and in like all the very best ways, and that's kind of a place that I like to be. You know, just professionally and and, and in general, is to always be learning something or always have some new challenge that you know requires you know sorting out new problems instead of just like okay, here's a set of knowledge I have. Let me apply this thing to you know whatever it is that. Uh, is this new, you know, novel problem? Yeah. Speaking about that, what, where, where, where does your eager to learn come from? Like, what have you done before daily? Before daily, I, professionally, like my career was, I, I was a university professor for about fifteen years, um, and so I taught a lot of web development classes, information architecture, database design, API design, all that kind of thing. So. Uh, but I approached it very much from sort of the academic side. I did some moonlighting as a web developer and um, got to do some pretty fun projects that uh, a part of that, like did a, a, a small web application that, of course, like most small web applications is now rest in peace. Um, but I worked with uh, the Newberry Library in Chicago to do some things with some of their archival materials. So, yeah, primarily classroom experience, but then always trying to figure out new ways to to, to, to keep learning because I think you know, education as much as any other space is a good place to, to get really set in your ways and, you know, end up being one of these, you know, instructors that, that just changes the date on the syllabus and calls it a day. It's like, for me, it was always like, nope, let's tear this down. Let's iterate. Let's learn whatever it's going to be. Yeah, I, uh, I had one of those instructors where it's like, I know that you knew this when you just started being an instructor and you're you're coming from a, a place of like uh pro, like you were a professional developer before but these are like four-year-olds best practices that we are supposed to be doing anymore <laughs> yeah. if you're doing four-year-old specifications like you're actually doing pretty well <laughs> it's, it's when it gets like 12 years old like yeah i think back in the day that was when uh like html5 was just like popular for two years and uh, they were all it was all like using just divs and uh, like very bloated javascript and it was yeah. uh it was a weird class <laughs> right well i mean there was this and i feel like this this happens in fewer sectors of the web now but but it i sometimes get the, the sense that people thought and some still think that like somehow html was done as of html 4.01 and 
and that whatever JavaScript was at, you know, in 99, 98 was kind of like, that's where JavaScript is at. And CS says there's nothing new under the sun. And so I wonder about that sometimes about where, where people, you know, on their own, like come to learn these things or what, what it is that they read or what it is that they consume so that they can say, all right, I need to learn something new. And this other knowledge that I spent, you know, countless hours slaving away reading or debugging or whatever it was that I was doing to, to, you know, earn this very hard one knowledge, I might have to take that and kind of like set all of it to the side, which I think is like one of the most, uh, you know, troublesome things that we do where it's like, not only do you spend all the time learning this, but then eventually it, 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 it reaches an expiration date and then you've got to start kind of all over again, or just accept that you're a beginner and, and that, you know, things have changed. Yeah, I, I totally agree with it. And I can also relate to it. I, I've been, before I was engineering manager, I've been like front-end developer for most of my career. And mm -hmm. uh, that means I had to relearn a lot and start over, for, sort of. Like I, when, when React and Angular just became popular, I was like very, no, I'm not going to do that. I uh, we just stick to vanilla JavaScript and... Uh, I just uh, unlearned how to use jQuery, so I'm not gonna now change into like React and uh, and Angular and everything. But at, at one point, it, you just have to sort of give in to it and like, okay, I I can do this. I'm not like someone who's who's stuck in their ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, because if I was like that, then I would still be creating things for Internet Explorer six. So I'm glad that we're. <laughs> going forward that's how you can create them for safari 15 instead oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> perfect <laughs> no i i think it's a good point and to me the, the the big question becomes how do you if if you do get into a cycle and i certainly know web developers like this that are always chasing the next big thing you know it's like oh today it's react next week it's who knows what um you know, what are the deeper sort of anchoring principles, right? Like the technologies or the languages, the frameworks that we use to do front end development change inevitably. And I think jQuery is an interesting one because I pretty much kept using jQuery to some extent until query selector and query selector all were available in, in vanilla JavaScript. And of course that syntax, the name of it was, was completely derived from um, jQuery, but for your own sake, like, like, what are the principles that you sort of anchor yourself to, you know, like when, when you have that moment where you say, I gotta, you know, go with the times and I've got to learn some React or I've got to learn some Vue, like, like, what are the, what are the things that anchor you when you're doing that learning? Um, that's a good question. And also not a hundred percent sure what you mean with anchoring, but, mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Um, well, I, I mean, I can I can explain a little bit. Like, like, what is the thing that you say? Like, this is a good front end design. Like, this is something that takes right. the needs of users, and like, that's what I kind of mean by anchor. So, yeah. So there's there's two things where I always look at. It's like I I, I want to have the user first, but the developer is also important. Like the ver developer experience. So documentation is one. Like mm. if if, docu if I don't understand like the first welcome page, I was I'm I'm out. I it's so <laughs> hard. Uh, I and that has has happened so many times. But the other thing is what I'm always searching for is uh, how do they handle accessibility? Like is, mm -hmm. is accessibility like a thing of what they're they're trying to to preach? Especially if you're looking at like JavaScript frameworks or something. Uh, it was very hard in the beginning of React to write React accessible. And uh, mm -hmm. that's, that's kind of what drove me away from it in the beginning as well. It's like, uh, I, I don't know how to do this without making screen readers uh, angry. Right, right. How, how about yourself? I'm like you. Like I, I am definitely, uh, documentation is something that has to be there. Like all the hype in the world, all the like, you know, best design kind of like website, like check out our framework. Like, like I, show me like you, like show me, maybe not page one of the documentation. I'll, I'll let myself go past that, but you know, go into some, you know, method definition or some property or, 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 or just, you know, pick a random place in the documentation as they're cross-linking back and forth. If I, you know, have a question because I'm reading about a method that says, oh, this, you know, inherits from this class, 
well, I want to link to that class. I don't want to have to now like open another tab and do another Google search and hope that I can like find my way back into the site. So, um, and I think, you know, to a large extent, I, I, if, if the documentation is writable, that is a bonus in general. Like if it's, if it's really well-written documentation, that's great. But if you can write the documentation either through pull requests or if it's Wikified or something like that, I think that's a really fun thing because I, I, I have a hard time sitting on my hands when I see a problem in documentation or I see something that's, you know, incorrect or whatever. It's like, I could fix this. Like, this is my exact problem right now. And I've got the, you know, piece of code that I'm working on that shows that this, you know, API is un improperly documented or something. So, you know, I think that there's something to be said for allowing, you know, community contributions, which is why I've always been such a big fan of like Mozilla Developer Network for vanilla JavaScript and for HTML and for CSS, because we need as a community, the ability to contribute to those documents and to, to make sure that they're uh, more than just a reference, but, but a product of all of the thinking and all of the doing that goes on day in and day out as you're working with different, uh, different methods. So I try to, I shouldn't say what I try to do. I'm working to do more, uh, more pull requests to MDN. I've got one that's open right now, actually a WebRTC related one that's about um, set, remote, remote, uh, set remote description, which is actually finally supported in Safari 15.4, which means we now have like a fully modern uh, WebRTC implementation on, on Safari. So yeah, doing those things, making those kinds of contributions and having that, th that's a big part of it for me as well. Yeah, that was... Uh... I've done that for quite a bit as well when uh, there was a, a website called webplatform.org, which was sort of a collaboration between Mozilla, Google, and uh, I think Internet Explorer and, uh, or Microsoft at least. Uh, they, they tried to make a sort of an MDN version, but then sort of uh, a collaborative version, which didn't pan out as well for various reasons. Yeah, um, was that the one that had the logo that looked like? Uh, I, I don't even know how, like. I wish I had a screen I could draw on right now, but it was almost like little, almost like erector set pieces that looked like they were bolted together. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. correct. I, I, I don't have it here, but I actually have like a, a, a an ex actual version of that logo which you could move around with. Oh, nice. Um, but well, I, I, I think one stream. Sorry. Sorry, we should do it like show and tell on a few. Yes, <laughs> yes. I I have some some uh, swag yeah. here as well. Like uh, that's a Mozilla dr dinosaur and a Firefox uh, fox. Um, what did I want to say? Oh yeah, well a lot of those contributions that I made back then uh, are now inside MDN as well, and it's always fun to see like people adding things to it and. Uh, I don't know. It's uh, it's good that we have this sort of community still, where we have the documentation, and uh, I think it's the whole whole of the community that that uh, drove me to to front end development in the first place. Because it was it's so easy to to view what other people have made uh, and to talk about it in different forums and. Uh, it was. I, th I think it was just a, a great. Uh, it's. Just, I think community is just a, a very important aspect of the whole development process. Mm -hmm. No, I agree with you, and that's. I mean, that's the funny thing is that, on the one hand, front end developers in particular like like to you know sort of wring their hands about like oh we've got a you know every single thing that we make ends up in so many different runtimes based on so many different browsers, and I you know. It's probably not an answerable question, but I wonder, you know, how much of the the web's history of trying to get to a spot of interoperability and write once and deploy everywhere, like how much that really sort of formed a basis for community. Because if you've got so many browsers at so many times and so many develop people developing different things, you you kind of have to go and seek out other people um, who might have had some particular problem or, or, or something like that. And not even necessarily like in a, I'll go post a question on Stack Overflow kind of way, but like, you know, where can I go to find, you know, documentation that, that, that sets the record straight or, or, or helps me determine, um, you know, what's a browser quirk and what's, you know, what's a, a me quirk because I wrote something wrong or wrote it suboptimally or whatever it is. 
Yeah. I uh, now just want to take a, a little moment and say hello to everyone in the chat. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, if you have any questions uh, for us or you want to contribute, just uh, say something in the chat. And uh, we're keeping an eye on it. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, since we're, we're, we're like, want to talk about dev tools as well, is there a certain to a tool or a utility that you uh, often use, Carl, that you want to, you always grab back. I yeah, I, I mean, I suppose it's kind of an obvious one, but I, I feel like I'm always looking for new and different ways of using Git for everything that I'm doing. Like I, I use it so much for dot files now, like, you know, personal configurations so I can keep that stuff in, a, in sync across different machines and, you know, whatever tooling I can build to, to be able to, you know, use the history and the, the portability of, of a version control system. That seems to me like something that is just so fundamental. And I think I know it's fundamental and I know that it's critical for development because if I'm ever in a situation where I'm not, or I haven't, you know, initialized a repository, which at, at this point, like that's second nature, like the touch command with whatever, you know, starter file and then get in it is like the thing right after that. But um, it just, it, to me, that that's something that's, that's always worth working on. And then even within uh, a, a repository, like just getting good at writing commits and writing them not kind of out of an obligatory, like, oh, I haven't written a commit in a while, but to, to write them so that other people can kind of follow along with the story, um, you know, that, that you as a developer are writing. I know, like, you know, contributing to a, a new project or something it, it's, it's always fun to like open that first file and you make your little fix and then you save it and then some automated thing right like maybe it's stripping empty lines or something from an editor and now suddenly you've got like this huge diff because all these lines had extra space at the end or something like that and then how do you you know tune your chops so that you can just you know even if you have to like drop into manual patch editing mode like say i just want to make a commit at these lines i can come back maybe later <laughs> once i've established myself in a project or something um to deal with these you know line ending issues or something like that so to me yeah version control is just such a that's that that just has to be there i think it's interesting that everybody almost everybody is using version control and Everybody is using it slightly differently. So there's so many things that you can do with it. And uh, like you say, using uh, dot .files for, for your setups. And, uh, uh, but also like just knowing the ins and outs of Git and using things like, like what you just mentioned, using something like cherry pick to make sure that you just have the one line that you want. And right. uh, there is so many things to keep learning about this. and. I actually, I don't really follow along like with the evolution of kits, like the new things or anything. Are you following that? Do you know any of new stuff that's happening there? A little bit. I, I um, will, I, I'm not religious about reading the, the version, like the change log that goes to Git. Um, I, I tend to find things more incidentally, usually because I'm looking something up about some command that I already know or, um, lately, I've been writing a blog posting series uh, elsewhere, not a, not on daily, but in other places to, to just talk about like Git configuration. And usually, that's how I kind of like stumble upon something um, that is that is new uh, in the system. But uh, for example, like something within the last year, I've started using is I, I, I'm you know have muscle memory for Git checkout. Like I that checkout just comes so easily. But it's such an overloaded Git command. Like you use it to go to a different branch. You use it to restore your, you know, files in your working directory. And, and a lot of the things you can do with Git checkout is super, super destructive. And if you goof up, and I'm amazing at goofing off, like checkout can really, you know, make things difficult. So now there's a Git switch command. And by now, I think that's probably been in Git for maybe two, two and a half years now. Um, I'll have to go back and fact check this, but. And Git switch is just meant for switching between branches. And just like you can do Git checkout hyphen B to create a branch with Git switch, it's hyphen C and that'll create it. And then you can jump back and forth. So there's, and I think that's the fun thing about something like Git is that you can, you can read all about these changes in, in the change log. But if you use a tool like Git enough, 
your muscle memory or your sort of habits in, of mind are so ingrained that it becomes like you almost have to like sit there and like it's like no we're doing get switch now we're not doing get checkout anymore like <laughs> not for this particular operation anyway and so that to me is the really the, the fun thing about a tool like that and that you know git is probably second only to like the design of HTML or something in terms of it being like fully backward compatible. I know there's just starting to be ways of like indicating what version of Git a repository was created with. I, I know just enough about that to have be absolutely <laughs> zero low information about it, but I know that that's that that kind of versioning thing is is finally kind of coming on the scene. So I'll be curious to see how that develops. But but how about you? Like you know, was there a tool that you use, or and if there is like. You know, how do you stay on top of like what's changed with it? Well, I, uh, of course, my editor is uh, like it's it's an easy one to say. Uh, everybody's using editors. I, I I I used to be a person who is very like using a, an editor that's as basic as possible. So mm -hmm. Notepad plus plus was my go to editor for a very long time, uh, and only since like a couple of years of using like like full-on editors like IDs and then now uh like with VS Code uh I almost cannot live without it like doing where you can do all like all, all in one I I don't use like I still use like my my iTerm for for my terminal but sometimes I just switch to 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 like clicking on checkout in, in, in VS Code just because it's easy, just because it's there and I, I just can do it quickly for some personal projects. I don't need to like have like full control over how Git works. Uh, and just having it like having different uh, ways to, to like show my code, whether I'm coding myself or whether I'm live streaming or uh, that's really helpful for, for the things that I'm doing. And uh, having VS Code is just, uh, has been great for me, at least. <laughs> yeah. I, I have not been able to, like, commit to VS Code. I'm uh, admittedly kind of, like, between editors right now. Um, I used to use, well, Notepad++ was, like, yeah, that that that, that brings back mostly fond memories, like maybe some, you know, runtime environment things on Windows, not so fond, but <laughs> in terms of like being an editor, um, that was an important one. I used to, and then I switched to BB edit around the time that I started using Macs more and more. Um, and then because of students, I actually started using Atom, which was the, the editor that, that GitHub and then later Microsoft acquired GitHub and, and now Atom has been sunset. But I started using that because I did, discovered that was the editor that every student in the class was using. It's like, oh, okay. So I should you know, try to meet students where they are. And then I kind of slowly found that, you know, being able to like have all the dot files and configuration stuff that you could do under the hood in Atom and do it in kind of like a, a operating system neutral way. Cause that's, to me, that's just so, I don't want to have to go back in and just redo all my settings. And yet I don't want to have to deal with like plist files and other kinds of like weird things that happen in, you know, libraries and preferences and stuff in Mac OS. So um, apparently there's a new project. I, I think about every week I go and, and annoy the, um, mailing list or the invite list there's a project called zed which i guess is the creators of atom that that and might may even be that code base carried forward i'm not sure but they're they're apparently working on that so um yeah i don't know I, like I, I i i have never like given into like the which what you talk about like with like jumping into the command line or, or being able to like run terminal commands from the editor partially because i like the jarring context switching between like oh i'm in my nice friendly graphical environment editor with all these you know amazing colors and you know little graphical hints and then to like go to like the just no nonsenseness of the command line and then to run get diff and to see okay what am i about to commit i in that moment in that kind of like switching from the editor to the to the terminal and running that and then seeing my code in a not nice way makes it really easy to see places like, oops, like I got to fix that little thing or here's some silly thing that I did. So yeah, yeah. I resist like the, 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 the kind of like all in one thing. And partially because yeah. I can't settle. Like I want to always be able to <laughs> hot swap everything and like, ah, oh, today this editor, isn't it? Like get rid of that, pulling another one in. 
So what what editor do you use in your terminal? Like there's always uh, wars about Emacs or Vim or... Right. I, I, I fall on the Vim side of that and I don't really have a good reason for it because I've never really used Emacs. Um, well, but... I, uh, I, I, I use Nano, so... Oh, okay. Sure. I don't know why. I, I started using that at one point and never... Like, I think that's mostly is whatever you're used to. There's, it's, it's, yeah. Yeah. I mean, when I first started hacking on Linux, like, you know, back in the late 90s, early aughts, like, like whatever distributions I was on, certainly with uh, Ubuntu, I think they defaulted to Nano or Pico, like one of those two flavors as like their default editor. Um, and then when I started using like straight up Debian or um, whatever it was, like th their, their default editor was Vi or Vim. Um, and I remember distinctly like the comfort of having like the, oh, control X, like that will exit and control C, like having like that little sort of faux toolbar at the bottom of Nano kind of like provided a comfort versus Vim, which it's like, well, if you don't know about the colon, then <laughs> you're, just, you're just, forget it. Like you're, yeah. <laughs> this isn't for you. And of course like, ah, you know, Every time I talk about anything with a command line editor or write about it, I always say, hey, if you get stuck here, you know, if you get a bit Vim screen and you want to hit escape, then hit colon and then hit Q exclamation mark or just Q if you haven't done anything and get out of there. But yeah. Yeah. I saw that uh, Lisa has a, a whole comment in the chat about uh, what she's using. Went from notepads to sublime text. <laughs> I also used sublime text for, for a little bit. Mm hmm. And then uh, Visual Studio for C Sharp and C++. I, uh, I remember that. I, I, before front-end development, I was a .NET developer. And uh, mm. that was like Visual Studio was the only good thing for C Sharp. <laughs> and then yeah, Cleon for, for us. Have you ever heard of Cleon? Or is it just purely a, a Rust thing? I don't know. I've never used Rust. Yeah, we'll have to get Lisa on here and she can tell us about it. Yes. <laughs> no pressure, Lisa. <laughs> Cilion. Oh, Cilion. Ah, okay. That's so oh, much to learn. Yeah. <laughs> Go land for Go and then VS Code. And Fleet. I've heard about Fleet. I hope it's uh, it will catch on. But uh, yeah. So there's a lot of a lot of things, a lot of tools, a lot of languages and everything. And but how, like, if you, if you know someone who is asking you, like, I'm interested in to get into tech, become a developer, uh, what, what would you tell them? Like, how, how, how would you help them get into tech? <laughs> or not, you know, if you say, like, <laughs> please don't, like, it's, <laughs> get away. <laughs> No, I mean, I think that, that that whenever anybody comes and wants to learn something or knows something or thinks that you have knowledge that will benefit them, one, my personal credo is like, of course, be generous, um, you know, especially if somebody is new and they're trying to, to you know, they want to do this for whatever reason. Um, but it's sometimes good to, to ask the questions like, you know, why? Like, what is it that you're trying to do? Um, you know, you sometimes it'll take the form of like, I really need to learn React, let's say, or I really need to learn, let's, you know, less and less, I think we've fragmented on like the CMS front, but in the, in the, in the old days, right? It'd be like, I really need to learn, you know, WordPress, or I really need to learn Drupal or whatever it was. And, and so that was a, an opportunity to say, well, what is it that you want to do that you think that that's the thing that, that you're, interested in doing, which is all me just sort of avoiding the question that you've asked, which is what advice do you give to somebody who wants to do development? And to me, and again, I'm prejudiced about this because it's it was my entry really in a serious way into programming, but I still think that the web is such a, a great first place to start. You know, you've got three different languages that are working in concert. So right away, you sort of build this little mental node map in your head that like, hey, you can, you know, it, it, it's not necessarily just one language that's responsible for everything. And so we can talk about the ways that different languages are, are put together and how they work together and how you sometimes need 
little hooks into each other. And of course, the big hook that works in the web is the document object model. And that's where it doesn't matter if you're hardcore in HTML or you love React or you want to write CSS, like we all, that is quite literally our interface where all of those things sort of come together. Um, and, you know, I, I, I love to, to, to push people towards, you know, some of the, what I think, still think of as like foundational books and, and uh, you know, like, I don't know, this would be a whole other episode that we could do, Jane, but we talk about like, what's the most influential like tech book you've ever read? And I think about like Jeremy Keith's book on Dom scripting. Ooh, and we could do total show and tell with it too. I have something, a Dutch web book here that I Ooh. found in my attic. It's called the Dynamic Web Design. Mm -hmm. And it shows you how to do uh, web design for Netscape Navigator and, uh, and and in Dreamweaver. And I think I use this book. I, I try to find good pictures, but there are not a lot of pictures. For web design, it's a very, it has like, how, how uh, let's see if you can see it. How does uh, Dreamweaver work and stuff like that? It's sure. uh, that was just like all of this, all of these these tech books, like you mentioned. There, there are some some very good things out there that you can read. Also, blog posts and yeah. and tutorials. Like I don't know when I started, we didn't really have a code school or whatever code code academy or something mm -hmm. things like that. They they were yeah. just not around and. Uh, I think one thing that I feel like is was very important for me is to have a mentor to guide me through the whole process. Oh, yeah. So I uh, I had a, a, a mentor that was uh, he was an involuntary mentor basically. <laughs> yeah, it, it was it was a friend of mine. He uh, he said to me like, "Oh, you uh, you made a few websites by yourself, right?" He said, yeah, do some HTML and see that's so like. You want to come work for us? That was basically my entry into professional wow. tech. Uh, and I'm like, yeah, sure. And uh, he sat next to me, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. Please help me. And that was like my first <laughs> few months of doing .NET C Sharp. It's like having him next to me and explaining how to do certain things, and uh, uh, having a person who you're not afraid to ask questions to. And uh, that is, I think, very important into getting into tech because. We sort of need to help each other out here. Uh, right. Yeah. And of course, you know, there are plenty of reputations <laughs> built around being mean and exclusionary and, and a lot of other things, you know, and, and that horrible kind of like, oh, we need to like somehow haze people that are new to this or make them feel bad about what it is that they don't know or whatever. And that's, you know, something that's easily done, but, you know, it, it can also be just tricky getting to the point where, um, you know, someone feels comfortable asking a question of you so that you can turn around and go from being the, the kind of mentee to the mentor. Uh, but, but so much of that is in approach and willingness. And I think like too, just admitting places where we goof up like that, that is such a, it's a humbling thing when it happens. And it's such a credibility thing that happens later when you can tell your stories. And of course, the longer that you're in tech and around tech, the more stories you can come up with of when you <laughs> For whatever reason, like some problem just, you know, it was like yeah. you had no experience at all. And you're, you're taken back to that very, very sort of early stage. It was like a beginner, like, you know, that yeah. helpless feeling of like, I don't know what to do. Like when you said, I, you know, I'd send to my mentor, I'd help me. I don't know what I'm doing. Like that, that feeling is, it, it resonates. And for anybody who's watching this, who might be a new developer, it never goes away. Not entirely. Like you eventually do, do build a trust, like, okay, I'm going to feel this for the next three minutes, or I'm going to feel this overnight or whatever it is. And I will come back tomorrow and I, it will not defeat me. But it, you know, that's, that's just a feeling that's there. It's part of the, the complexity that we work in and amongst. And it's the, the fact that any one human brain can only hold so much, so much of the picture. And so the more that you can communicate and collaborate and network with people, the better off you're going to be uh, and able to, you know, solve problems and build cool things. Yeah. Yeah, it never goes away. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a question in the chat from uh, Alex likes Python. Well, we all like Python. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are there any websites or online learning platforms you suggest? Currently doing a CS bachelor's, but want to learn more outside classes. 
Yeah. Well, you you were a teacher. You were you were a teacher. You're always a teacher. I was. What, was it was a teacher always a teacher? That's right. Yeah, That's something about taking somebody out of the classroom. No, and it's fun because like when I taught, I was, uh, well, I was in a few different de departments. But when I left, ultimately, I was in an information technology department. Um, and had a number of CS students that would come over to take classes with me because in the historical traditional divide, right, like computer science, which is highly theoretical, and then you've got, you know, some places called information science, information technology, whatever it is, tends to be the more applied side. I reject those claims out of hand. You cannot do the theory of computer science without being able to write some code. On the other hand, if you're just blindly writing code someplace and not thinking about any of the sort of larger structures, then you're doing something, but I'm not sure if it's if it's programming or whatever. So in response to the question, I think, um, you know, it's it's good to do a little shopping around. Uh, Alex likes Python. I don't want to assume that uh, your your name is, is any part of that. Um, but to me, it's some of the stuff like we were talking about a little earlier in case you were here, like, you know, is it community developed? Um, some of the best educational materials like for learning the web stuff is lurking in and about like uh, in Mozilla Developer Network. Like they've been quietly building different sort of curricular modules in there for doing things. From there, if you're talking about learning a specific language, you want to go and just spend some time with the community and figure out, is there an established book out there that people use, uh, you know, to learn Rust or to learn Go or to learn Ruby or to learn Python or whatever the language is, is because I think that, you know, it's, it's tempting to go into Google and write like, I need a book on Rust. And so Rust book free online, you know, whatever the <laughs> search terms are. But, you know, part of learning any language is, is not just about, you know, what's the syntax here? How do I access a member of an, an array or, you know, whatever the programming thing is. It's also about like, how does this language want me to think? And how does the community of people that ma maintain and, and uh, you know, build this language, want me to grow. I mean, one of the things that was the weirdest reading experience maybe ever in my programming life was my first exposure to Ruby was a book called Wise Poignant Guide to Ruby, which is one of the most outlandish books on a language. And I don't, the original URL has long since gone, but thankfully people have like torrented it and, you know, uploaded it all over the place, but it's like the most circuitous thing. And yet, I learned Ruby from that. And some of the people that have been in the Ruby community the longest, like a lot of us came through wise poignant guy. Then we went and got the pickaxe, which is the big um, Ruby reference that pragmatic uh, programmers publishes, which actually is out, I think in a new beta, beta today for the Ruby two, three um, edition. But that's all a very long way of saying, take some time rather than saying, I really need to learn this language. Um, Take some time to expose yourself to the community and figure out like, you know, where are they going and what topics are you interested in and, and you know, what's available there for free. And, you know, sometimes, especially while you're a student, it's really easy to get books through your library, even tech books and things like that. Like that was something that was always a revelation to my students who were, you know, like, really, I can like they thought like if you requested a book from the library, it had to be like, you know, 150 years old and covered in dust. It's like, no, if, if you want this like up-to-date book on data mining and Python, like you can request that. So get to know your librarian um, and put in those requests through your li your school's library because those actually help them to figure out how to budget and spend resources in the future. Anyway, that's my shout out to librarians. <laughs> <laughs> Public libraries are amazing, by the way. I, I like, they're, they have so many things that you might not know. If you ever go to your own public library, they, like some of them even have like, uh, power tools for oh, you really? to learn and things like that. It's it's bizarre what they have nowadays. But uh, yeah, uh, shout out to librarians. Mm -hmm. uh, also, other learning platforms. Well, besides like the websites like Code Academy and stuff like that, I would I would also suggest going to meetups. Like I, I've learned mm -hmm. so much not from just from the, the 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 topics that people talk about at meetups, but also from just talking to people that attend the meetups. Like if you go to offline meetups, if you're comfortable with doing that nowadays, then uh, I would seriously suggest doing that at one point as well. Um, yeah. yeah that's, I think that's so much me is like, and still like, you know, I always think like in terms of books and, you know, me kind of like in front of my computer and forget about the obvious, like 
go and meet some people that are already yes. doing this. Yeah, and go into discords. There are plenty of discord channels that have that from specific languages or 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 maybe from meetup groups that have their own discords uh, or Slack channels. Um, yeah, I think it's uh, uh, it's so different from how it is nowadays than how it was 15 years ago when uh, we started learning all of this. Yeah. Um, and I think it's uh, there's so much more to learn, but there's also so much, many more people to learn from. And it's, uh, I think it's it's still great, a uh, great place to work in in uh, in tech in the web especially. Yeah, especially because you know I think this actually kind of brings us full circle from where we started. But like you know there is such a tremendous value placed on learning and like ongoing learning. You know, so again it goes back to that thing that you know it's not like we work in some kind of you know languages that are like Latin or something that are dead and you know, we'll never have a new verb or a new noun or something like that. It's like, no, these are, these are living things. And, and provided that that continues to be the case that, you know, that, that learning is ongoing. Yeah. You know? And I will, I will never forget the blink deck. <laughs> well, that, that uh, to this day yeah. is, is one of the, the great, amazing, things that was ever created but you know it also became a clarifying rallying point and especially in the web standards movement about like this is the excess like this is why we need a separate style sheet language because to have you know in the same bucket like here are headings and here's an anchor pointing someplace and then here's this thing that blinks <laughs> it's like no 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 and that's how you know blink and center and you know bold which got reclaimed in some ways in html5 but that's how those things that you know, eventually ended up uh being jettisoned you know still supported yeah. <laughs> you can still technically as valid html5 right blink tag just please don't. <laughs> i don't think blink actually works really yeah so there, that's 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 the other thing about blink and marquee is that was the reason uh mm -hmm. they said okay we don't need needs to be backwards compatible for everything it's yeah. okay to, to to deprecate things and remove them from browsers yeah we'll have to check the specs because I, I feel like it's in the spec but meaning that, that like it's there please don't use it but i think you're also right in that even if you do use it it's not going to have its intended effect in the browser anymore yeah so yeah, anyway i, <laughs> I uh uh I, I think we're sort of running out of time. I wanted to do 30 minutes and we are now at 42 minutes. So uh, I think that's pretty great, right? It was yeah. fun chatting and it, uh, I'm, I'm glad that uh, so many people joined today. Uh, I hope it was, it was as fun for you as it was for us. And yeah, um, and maybe uh, we'll see what we talk about next time, but uh, hopefully uh, you will all join again. Absolutely. And thank you for being here, Carl. Thank you for having me, Jane. And uh, yes, see you all next week, I guess. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.